Each month, the Mount Prospect Public Library offers movies at MPPL and movie chats, giving patrons the opportunity to view and discuss both current and classic motion pictures. On May 16th, a special library event shines a spotlight on a Hollywood legend and the author who wrote about his career. Joining me today on Library Life to discuss his library program and book, Warren William, Magnificent Scoundrel of Precode Hollywood, is author John Stanglin. Welcome. Good morning. Let's start off by talking a little bit about Warren William and um, about his career for those of us who are not really familiar with his work. All right. Um, I mean, this part of the problem of sort of selling the idea of Warren William, he's been forgotten by Hollywood history. Uh, everybody remembers, of course, Humphrey Bogart and Clark Gable and people like that. Mm -hmm. But during a period in the early 1930s, Warren William was as big of a star as any of those men. Uh, he came to Hollywood in 1931 from the Broadway stage, um, and for about five years he was a big star. Um, he had his first big success in 1932 with a picture called The Mouthpiece. And from there, he was in movies like Lady for a Day, Gold Diggers of 1933. Mm -hmm. uh, people would remember him from the original Cleopatra with uh, Claudette Colbert. Mm -hmm. um, and his, the picture that most people would know him for today is the original Wolfman with uh, Lon Chaney from 1940. He had a supporting role in that. By that time, his career was diminished. But uh, for a period in the early 30s, he was a big star. So what prompted you to sit down and write write a book about this man? Uh, well, I grew up watching movies uh, in Chicago, WGN, and uh, all the great TV stations who ran all those fantastic old movies with the big stars from the 30s and 40s. I sure remember that. Oh yeah, it was mm -hmm. a great time. And in particular, I loved Warner Brothers. They had Errol Flynn, uh, Humphrey Bogart, Edward G. Robinson, James Cagney, and I watched all those movies, every movie that I could see by those those stars and the directors who made those movies. Um, but sometime about seven or eight years ago, a friend who was also movie obsessed handed me a tape of three movies and said, you should watch these. Right. They were three Warren William movies, Employee's Entrance, Skyscraper Souls, and The Mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. And I put these movies in and I watched them and number one, I couldn't believe I'd never seen him before. I had no idea who he was. In all those years of watching movies, I was stunned. Is he sort of in invisible in the movies because of well, the roles that he has? He's he's invisible in his later period after he was a star. Mm -hmm. the The problem with his early movies, in which he was a st in a starring role, he played these extremely um, base, contemptible, corrupt, predatory characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the movies during this period that is known as the pre-code Hollywood period, before censorship was really strongly enforced, um, there were a lot of racy elements, strong language, um, adult themes, and a lot of those movies I later realized couldn't be played on television during the 50s and early 60s I see. Uh, because they were considered too racy for television. Mm -hmm. So the impact of seeing him in those roles where he's very different than he is in those later supporting roles, um, was amazing. To see him, he was a completely unique character that I, I had ever experienced on screen before. And so I was totally fascinated. And I began to, little by little, do some research and try to figure out who this man was. And then here, here comes his book. And here's the book, well, you know, three and a half years later. Now let's talk a little bit about Pre-Code Hollywood and mm. just kind of, you know, delve into that for a second. What, what was that all about? Well, um, you know, as long as there have been Hollywood movies, there's been censorship. Um, in the beginning, there were uh, movements, local movements generally, in state and city governments to censor films back in the teens and the early 20s. Um, there became a national effort in the early 20s, and by 1930, uh, they created what they call the production code. But the strange thing was, it was created and administered by the studios. Mm -hmm. So there was nobody to punish them if they transgressed the code, <laughs> which they did frequently. Um, so the period from about 1930 to the summer of 1934 was a relatively open period where studios could kind of delve into the underside, uh, the seamy side of American life. Mm -hmm. So you saw a lot of stories about infidelity, prostitution, um, crime, gambling, um, all, all different kinds of aspects of American life. And in 1934, 
the Catholic Church um, sort of raised the specter of a boycott. Right. And uh, as a result, that was the point at which the studios became more serious about controlling content, and we got kind of the style of Hollywood that we perceive today from that period, you know, Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland putting on a show in the backyard and yes. et cetera, et cetera. But for that four year period, um, it was pretty wide open and I think a lot of people would be surprised by the content of those films. Now he has been called the king of pre-code. Mm -hmm. You dubbed him the magnificent scoundrel of yes. pre-code Hollywood. So why is he so associated with that era? Well, certainly his greatest starring roles are in that period. Um, mm -hmm. He had a, a strong career afterwards. After the code was imposed, he moved on to parts that were more um, on the correct side of the law. So he played a lot of lawyers and detectives. He was the first man to play Perry Mason. Mm -hmm. um, he did a series of films called The Lone Wolf in which he was sort of like this urbane gentleman thief who is now you know, on the right side of the law. But in that earlier period, he had this uncanny knack of being predatory and mean uh, but maintaining a certain level of audience sympathy for himself right um, and I, I'm still not sure exactly where that comes from but there's this innate ability for him to keep audiences on his side even though he's doing terrible terrible things to the people around him now he he was sort of a latecomer to the screen basically wasn't mm -hmm. he he was um, a Broadway star as you mentioned yes but um, he was in his late 30s when basically the talkies were popular right I, I, exactly so how do you think that affected his career well um, he had a really solid background in in acting he went to the American Academy uh, Dramatic uh, Academy of Arts in New York mm -hmm. which is a school that had been around since the 1890s right. uh, it produced a lot of stars, Edward G. Robinson went through there, Spencer Tracy, a ton of people went through there. So he had a tremendous background in, uh, um, in acting. He had a lot of work, a very trained voice, a very cultured voice. Mm -hmm. And of course, when Hollywood transitioned to sound in 1927 and 1928, they were right. looking for uh, anybody who had a wonderful voice. So they went to uh, Broadway and tried everybody. Mm -hmm. And eventually, after a couple of tests, he was finally one of the people that they brought uh, to Hollywood. Um, and it took him about, uh, I think it was his fifth picture, was the mouthpiece, which was the one that turned him into a big star. But he was sort of like this hybrid of a cultured aristocrat, but at the same time, this modern Depression era man. So right. he could skirt both sides. And he was a contract player for Warner Brothers. Yes. And how did that affect him? Um, well, like most people who worked for Warner Brothers um, and other studios during the period, you were basically an indentured servant. Right. Um, whatever the studio said you should do, you did. And so he went from picture to picture over and over again uh, during those years, working four or five weeks on a picture, taking a week or two off and working on the next picture. And he was somewhat typecast by Warner Brothers in the right. same way that James Cagney and Edward G. Robinson and Humphrey Bogart became uh, gangsters again and again, and Errol Flynn, you know, was always in tights and <laughs> swashbuckling. Um, so when he became a success in the mouthpiece as this amoral biz uh, lawyer, uh, they began to just put him in those roles over and over and over again, and, and he did become a little bit typecast in those early years. Right. Um, so he was kind of at the whim of Warner Brothers and he, he had his battles with them over uh, the types of roles he should have and uh, you know what they were doing with his career and they, they weren't they did not always give him good choices right so tell me about <coughs> your library program what will you be uh, talking about in your library program and I understand you've got a movie that you're going to be showing as well we will be showing a movie. We're going to be showing, as I've mentioned a couple times, the mouthpiece, which is you know his big one. His right? big one. Yes. It, was a, it was an immense, big, big success for Warner Brothers in 1932. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a wonderful picture in which he plays um, an assistant district attorney mm -hmm. who uh, obtains a capital conviction. Turns out that the accused was innocent, uh, but in perfect movie fashion, the switch is thrown and the boy is put to death. Uh, before they can get through to the governor's office. Oh. And so he, uh, he basically goes on a drinking binge and winds up um, becoming the defender of the criminal filth of New York.
Uh, he's, he cynically reinvents himself as the person who will save anybody from going to prison. Wow. Um, that sounds like a phenomenal story. It, it's a wonderful story. It's based on the life of um, William Fallon, who was a, an attorney in New York in the mm -hmm. teens and 20s who defended underworld figures. Um, and Warner Brothers was sued by Fallon's daughter, but uh, she lost. <laughs> Fortunately, they, uh, they changed it enough to, uh, to, to avoid prosecution, right? Yeah. But it, it's a great movie. It has a great character arc, this person who comes from a point of decency and morality and who is, you know, broken emotionally and then kind of has to redeem himself uh, at the end of the picture. So we'll be talking a little bit about the themes in that movie. Uh, we'll be talking about Pre-Code Hollywood, and then after the movie we'll have questions and answers if anybody is interested in learning more about Warren William or his career. Okay, well let's talk a little bit about your book before we end. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, uh, tell me what, what you cover in this book. Well, uh, the book has a couple of themes. One is his, um, I has hesitate to say subservience, but his willingness to sort of um, support strong women. He grew up in a house with his mother and grandmother and uh, two sisters. Um, and on Broadway and in films, he spent a lot of time with women. He spent a lot of time supporting women. Uh, he spent a lot of times in films and plays on feminine themes written mm -hmm. by women. Um, so that's one of the themes of the book is sort of examining, you know, how and why and where that came from. Uh, another thing is the idea of why some people are remembered and some are forgotten, and, and mm -hmm. that's part of the, uh, the idea behind the book is, you know, if you, if you like something, if you see it and you enjoy it, part of the idea is like, please pass it on to other people who may not see it uh, mm -hmm. or know about it, because otherwise then that history is lost. Um, and then I hope that it has a flavor of the times in which he was working. So, uh, you know, little pieces of background and history of the era in which he lived and worked. Well, it sounds fascinating. I thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you. For more information on Warren William, Magnificent Scoundrel of Pre-Code Hollywood, or any upcoming Mount Prospect Public Library event, call the library at area code 847-253-5675 or visit our website at www.mppl.org.